Who's that? That's me. Ha ha ha. Throwback. Uh, we are on kick. We are live. But by the time you see this, we probably won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. This channel above me, if you happen to miss a live, this is where you can catch the live. Any highlights and things of that nature. Oh, it's 2 p.m. in the UK? Okay, okay. Bet, bet, bet it up, bet it up, bet it up. We also got the Patreon. Uh, we started Sherlock on Patreon. W show already. Uh, we about to start Line of Duty as well. And now we voting on the last empty slot right here. It's time to vote. So, yeah, man. It's, 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 it's good over there. And don't forget, we also got the Discord as well, man. Discord plays a big part on Kick because you can't send links through the chat. So, got to get on Discord. The link to all of this stuff is down below in the description. It's called Linktree. You'll see it down there. Click it. All my socials and everything else that I got going on will pop up in there. Choose wisely. Mm -mm. This is Britain's youngest ever killer. I know it's Monday, we're supposed to relax on a Monday, but this has been in my watch later for at least a couple weeks, and I've been eyeing it. I wish y'all can just add to my watch later. That'd be cool. Anyway, let's get into this, man. This is by Twisted Minds. I hope they let me post it. If not, it's going on Patreon. Anyway. It was the summer of 1992. 18-year-old Katie Ratcliffe had just split up with her first serious boyfriend. Katie was being trained to be a hairdresser and was an apprentice hairstylist in the southeast of England's Bumble 2 salon. She was a girl full of joy and big dreams. At this age, there's a lot going on in a person's life. It is. They may be experiencing heartbreaks, whatever, from friends or partners, and they are also figuring out who they are and what they are going to be. Katie just got out of high school. I know y'all know what high school is. I forgot what y'all call primaries. I don't know what y'all call. But she just got out of high school. She's still figuring out herself. Side note, this is for anybody that's leaving high school. Your high school crush is the one. <laughs> I don't care what nobody says. She's the one. This is for guys at least. She's the one. She's mature than you right now. There's gonna, there's not gonna be nothing better. She's the one. And Katie had figured out her path and planned out her life. She wanted to be a hairdresser and was fully passionate about it. She even aspired to have her own salon one day as she just admired this career. As a typical teenager, Katie loved hanging out with friends, dressing up and attending clubs. She was not the sitting at home all day kind. She was lively and social. She had recently suffered Katie a heartbreak, outside. however. Partying all night was the last thing on her mind. Her best friend, Michelle, found her sulking and encouraged her to leave the house and enjoy herself. To take her mind off the heartache, Katie agreed to go to a local nightclub in Camberley called Ragamuffins. The girls swayed along to the beats and even had a little alcohol. All in all, they were having a good time. And the worries in Katie's mind started to fade. Life seemed good. That was until she saw one thing she wanted to forget. Her ex-boyfriend. By this time... I think I've done a Twisted Mind reaction before. Man, if y'all get into YouTube and you have the patience, make documentaries. But make them so people like me can react to them time Katie had lost Michelle somewhere in the crowd of partying teens. With hopes of getting back together and creating another spark, Katie went to the guy and poured her heart out. Instead of a warm hug, she got her heart shattered when the boy informed her that he was already seeing someone and had even brought her to the club. Utterly dead. City boys. Devastated. Katie left the nightclub. Michelle had earlier caught a glimpse of Katie talking to her ex-boyfriend, and since she was nowhere to be found, she assumed that she had gone with him. So Michelle and her other friends headed home. That's an L friend. 
leaving Katie behind. You gotta make With sure. blurred vision and a little alcohol in her system, Katie started making her way home. Unfortunately, life had other plans for Katie. The following morning in Farnborough, a group of four boys around the age of 14 got awoken by water droplets on their face and clothes. It turns out their tent was not waterproof and the rain had seeped through them. The boys loved the great outdoors and had spent the entirety of the night camping. They were, however, camping in the backyard of one of their homes because of their young age. Already having their sleep cut short, the boys decided to get up and go for a walk. Around 8 a.m., as they strolled down the walkway next to Victoria Road Cemetery, they came across a sight that would be etched in their brains for the rest of eternity. Young Katie Ratcliffe's body was found lifeless, with an image that would haunt any onlooker for life. The boys saw an uncovered and utterly bloody corpse. The body had been left mutilated along a wall in a cemetery beside a parked car. There was a lot of blood. One can only imagine how horrified the young boys were after coming across such a vicious sight. Police roped off the area and started poking around in the cemetery. The heart. Y'all know where I'm about to go with this. Michelle, you left your friend. I, listen, I know this is real. Never leave your friend. If you, if you can't get in touch with your friend and you came together, you come together, you leave together. Period. Yo, period. You come together, you leave together. And if I'm going through something, let me go through it. Don't drag me out. Just come come through. Come kick it with me in the crib. Like, like I don't want to go outside. This is what happens when stuff is forced. The job of identifying his daughter's remains fell to Katie's father. Later, a post-mortem revealed that the body had been stabbed a total of 32, 32? times. Some of the wounds had been so severe that the blade had completely cut through her body. Most of her wounds were to her body, puncturing her liver, stomach, lungs, heart, and genitalia with purposeful wounds. The corpse had multiple stabs in the chest, vagina, and anus. Forensics concluded that the person- the Yorkshire River? Who is this? The perpetrator probably felt excited while torturing the victim, as some of the stab wounds were inflicted after the victim had already passed away. The jewelry she had been wearing had been stolen. It was brutal, to say the least. The adolescent boys admitted to hearing cries in the early morning hours, but discounted them as individuals fooling about. The injuries on Katie's corpse suggested that the killer used a knife with a blade length of 6.5 to 7 inches and a width of roughly 3 inches. As shown by the bruises on her body, Katie had been dragged. However, the police Wait, who were investigating the bruises on her body, Katie had been dragged. dragged. However, the police who were investigating the case weren't certain if her corpse had been killed by someone else. Hi. It's w at. ...and dragged here, or if it had been transferred to the area where it was found. But... Katie was last seen in the nightclub in Camberley. How did she end up in Farnborough, which is an entirely different town? Farnborough is right on the border of Camberley, and Katie had been found five miles away from where she was last seen. Police searched the cemetery again the next day, but they were unable to uncover any significant evidence or information on Katie's murderer. The cops kept tracking down and speaking with other visitors who had been at the Ragamuffins on Saturday night. The police initially suspected a male killer in his 20s or 30s who would be strong enough to carry the victim of being the culprit, as the body was found almost naked with her clothes being pulled up. Due to the nature of the attack, the police believed it to be a sexual crimes case. With that, the search for a full-grown, sadistic male was... Well, hold on. Why is this? In, why is there a Chicago police car? This is in the UK. I know exactly where this is too. This is where FBG Duck died. But anyway, sexual motivation started, but they could have not been more wrong. The police showed interest in and interviewed many suspicious men, 
including a peeping Tom dressed in black that had been observed watching women on the dance floor, a black man that had an arrow carved in his head, an Asian kickboxer, and many, many. How about her ex? More. Over 500 people who had been at Ragamuffins that evening were all interviewed by the authorities. Katie's un- 500 persons ragamuffins was busting. It was popping. Okay, okay, continue. Unsolved murder attracted a lot of media attention and even got featured on true crime TV program Crime Watch. Two native tycoons offered a reward of 10,000 pounds to anyone who found the murderer. The Ratcliffe family also got caught up in the spotlight. In the midst of a live stream news conference, Katie's father commented, we are numbed by the senseless killing of our daughter. Every time the police suspected someone, it led to a dead end. Little did the police know that they were overlooking the devil due to their assumptions, They're and the real killer the went unidentified. With no lead or even a close idea of the suspect, the case was added to the farm borough's dusty pile of cold cases. And with that, the Ratcliffe family and the general public of Farnborough were left with no hope no justice given to their daughter for such a senseless and sadistic killing. Never in one's wildest imagination would someone link such a gruesome act of violence to an adolescent kid. No yeah, one, why not? Not a si I'm still trying to like, find the link right now. The title and the, what's going on so far in the first seven minutes. Single soul would believe that the murderer working a six inch knife would be a 12 year old girl. This incident would uncover the unimaginable, the youngest female killer in the history of the UK. Twelve year old girl? I am a killer. Killing is my business, and business is good. She Most kids right. at the age of 12 are seen playing with dolls, right cars, and consoles. This particular 12 year old liked playing with lives. Welcome, or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and this is the case of Sharon Carr, also known as the devil's daughter. Early life, twisted minds. Hold on, is am I subscribed? Let me sub up. <laughs> Sharon Louise Carr was born on December 21st, 1981 in Belize. Belize. Carr was brought up by her mother and stepfather, along with her three siblings. The four children had three fathers. Yet Carr failed to know who her biological father was. She experienced a life of great poverty and chaos. Carr and her siblings lived on an empty stomach on a daily basis. The stepfather was a violent drinker who frequently assaulted her mother and often Sharon and her siblings. The mother herself wasn't exactly a role model. She was a feisty, violent woman who frequently vented her fury on the helpless kids. Sharon reported that she was punished frequently by her mother in violent ways, occasionally burning parts of her body with cigarettes. In the early 80s, Carr's mother came across George Carr, a Jamaican soldier who was in the British Army. At the time, George was staying on a mission in Belize. They fell in love and George returned to England, eventually tying the knot in 1982 when Sharon was three years old. In 1986, they decided to move to England with the kids to settle down. So you gotta be careful, man, what your kids are exposed to when they're young and throughout their life. If you're going through it with your partner, man, I, do your best to keep it away from your kids because they, they take in way more than what you think they can take in. Oh, she won. She ain't gonna remember. Yeah, she might not remember, but it's in there. It's in her. <laughs> down in Camberley. For him. The move was great for Sharon, much better than the poverty-stricken life in Belize. At least she had a school here. She made some acquaintances, and there seemed to be some light. One can only imagine the daily disturbances occurring in the house. These acts of aggression could have had an effect on the children, especially Carr and their view of violence. Believe it or not, Sharon was a popular and sweet girl at her school. Her teachers at Cordwallis Junior School in Camberley described Sharon as obliging and kind. Her friends considered her a social butterfly with a few hints of aggression. She was also observed to prefer the company of older boys. Despite appearing a normal father issues, older boys. 
I'm just peeping what I hear. Schoolgirl. The world would sense. soon find out that there was something very wrong going on with Sharon. The Descent to darkness. With time, Sharon's persona started to change. Sharon got in with the wrong crowd. A group of bad behaving kids would hang around the rougher areas near her home. Sharon started to do all the things that would horrify a normal mother. She got into stealing. No. She was van. When I trip for two to Miami Beach. Yeah. I live in Miami. I'm already here. Not exciting. Public prop by a normal mother. She got into stealing. She was vandalizing public property. She was buying and selling drugs. The troublemakers did a big number on her, and by the age of 11, she was smoking weed every day. Regardless of your thoughts on marijuana, we can all agree 11 is too young, especially for daily use. Yeah, 11 at daily use is crazy. 11 at all is wild. Sharon started to behave irrationally and show attention-seeking behavior. She often displayed riotous tendencies and had frequent run-ins with authority. She even started taking an interest in weapons, often carrying a knife with her. She would even keep a knife in her school bag, taking it to school with her. Her father was tired of Sharon's behavior and the aggressiveness that he faced in the family. He announced that he had enough of it and wanted to leave the family. So this is the stepfather? Soon enough, the house was struck with another trauma. In a desperate effort to end their binding, George traveled to Camberley to have one last confrontation with Sharon's mother, Molly. Without any oh, okay. provocation, in a fit of fury, Sharon's mother poured boiling hot oil over her stepfather's head, leaving him in Whoa. agonizing pain. This particularly heinous act of domestic violence caused both parents to be hospitalized with very serious burns all over. Sharon's mother was charged with assault and was required to receive mental health therapy for three years. Soon after, their marriage came to an end. Well, Sharon had grown up surrounded by abuse. For her, this level of aggression and violence had become the norm. Her mother was abused by their father, and the kids were abused by both of them. And if we have learned anything from true crime... Oh, she just grew up bogus. She was, she, she was handed the roughest deck of cards from the start. We know that this is a cycle that is going to continue and someone else is going to get squished under it. Sharon witnessed this scene when she was just eight years old and was not at all phased. She was neither surprised nor scared by any of her parents. She, Sharon, said nothing. She did nothing. According to George, her stepfather, she just stood there and watched as the situation got out of hand. Sharon was, she, was always listening. Low key, what was she supposed to do? Watching and witnessing violence. If you are cruel to a child, that child grows up learning to be cruel. It That's a fact. Your children are a direct def a, a, a reflection of you. Whatever you do, they do. <laughs> if there wasn't already enough deviousness going on in her life, Sharon also took an interest in the practice of voodoo. Voodoo is a religious practice most common in Africa, where people make connections with spirits. Sharon's mother was the one who- This is very common in Belize too. Belize, um, Haiti, everywhere. Introduced like it to her. She was herself a practitioner and told Sharon about her beliefs and rituals. Her mother even taught her rituals that involved sacrificing animals. While talking to the police later on, Sharon's stepfather reported that her mother claimed to have supernatural abilities. She reckoned that by reciting certain prayers at certain times and in certain places, she could do people harm. Sharon believed it. Sharon naturally developed a deep interest in voodoo since she saw it it's as real a means of acquiring authority and control. Basically, she just got completely rowdy and changed drastically. So much so that in 1990, the school's head teacher had to ring up the social services about her actions. Social services had put Sharon into foster care, but that was short-lived. Sharon returned to her home shortly, after spending just a month in foster care. It seemed like she liked pushing people's boundaries. 
Sharon started going to secondary school, and by that time, her mother had met someone new. The new partner was a laborer who already had two daughters from a previous. Then her mom just jumping from dude to dude to dude to dude. It's relationship. In 1991, the partner moved in to live with them. Her first year of secondary school went unnaturally well. She kept her grades in line and also joined the basketball team. But as they say, nature does not change. Crimes. The 7th of June, 1992 marked the day of full darkness for Katie Radcliffe's family. Katie was an 18-year-old hairdresser who went to the Ragamuffins nightclub. You know exactly when I'm starting line of duty. <laughs> in Surrey just to have a fun evening. She was a joyful young girl who usually had a very happy and friendly persona. During that time, Katie ran into her previous boyfriend who informed her that he had a new girlfriend. This news affected Katie, and she decided to just head back home. With her head down and little alcohol in her body, the 18-year-old started to make her journey back home. Out of nowhere, little Sharon attacked Katie. Mind you, Katie was a total stranger to Sharon and had no reason for the attack. Sharon started repeatedly stabbing with her six and a half inch big knife in different parts of Katie's body. She stuck the knife through the teenager's ribs genitals, and anus, showing absolutely no mercy. Nice. The stabbing was so rough that some of the blows went completely through Katie's body. After Take care of your skin. All the way through, front, back. Yo. It was done that some of the blows went completely through Katie's body. After she was done stabbing, Sharon and some of her evil associates took the body and drove it Possibly. to Farnborough. We can watch As that. if the body had not been through enough, it Wait, was what? drove it. Sharon and some of her evil associates took the body and drove it to Farnborough. As if the body had not so been through enough, effort. it was dragged along the road and then eventually thrown carelessly by a wall in a cemetery. The body was left almost naked and completely mutilated. To an onlooker, this would seem to be the work of a vile man with both sexual and murderous intent. And that is exactly what the police believed. Although there were no signs of sexual assault, the nature in which the body was found, with the clothes piled up and multiple injuries to sexual organs, made it seem very When does another show start on Patreon? When a show ends. So when the next show ends, which is which is a uh, peep show or misfits, the following week in their place will be line of duty. I feel like you know that. <laughs> I feel like you do know. You just not you just not putting it together. Very possible that this would only be the work of sexual organs made it seem very possible piled up in multiple injuries to sexual organs made it seem very possible that this would only be the work of a fully grown male. Her ex-boyfriend was ruled out as a murder suspect. When talking about the night Katie was killed, he told the reporters, "If only I had taken Katie home as she asked me to." She would be alive today. That will haunt me for the rest of my life. And so the- I don't blame you, my boy. I don't blame yourself. Who? I don't blame anybody, but if I was to put the blame on somebody, which I'm not, it'd be on my, the, the friend that left her. I ain't even gonna say her name. The friend that left her is the one. She brought her out, did not, did not, did not do what friends were supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? I'm going through a rough breakup. I'm having a hard time. I just want to be in the crib. I want to watch TV. I want to eat chocolate. I want to, you know what I'm saying? I want to order pizza. You dragged me out. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm the life of the party. You dragged me out. Because you can't have a good time without me, apparently. I came out. And then you left me. Hunt for a male killer began. That's just my thought. With process. that, 
the real culprit got overshadowed, helping her make an oh, you good, bro. escape. The case went unsolved at first, letting the killer roam freely in the streets. We do not blame the police here. I mean, who would think that a 12-year-old girl would have the heart to kill a person, let alone in this manner? While talking to the reporters, Mrs. Ratcliffe stated, you just think, why her? Katie was very trusting. She often used to say to me that I worried too much. She was a normal, jolly girl. I don't think there will ever be a time when it's behind me. I'll carry it to the grave. As you should. However, do not be disappointed, as this case would be reopened two years later. Anne Marie Clifford. Ooh. With Sharon left uncaught, she went on with her life and returned to school. Along with her life, she continued her literally murderous habits. On the two-year anniversary of the murder of Katie Ratcliffe, Carr was back with another strike, but this time, it was at the school. On June 7th, 1994, the exact date that Katie died, Sharon apparently had another mission in mind. They say that we should beware of people who are nice to our faces, yet continue to stab us in the back. 13-year-old Anne Marie Clifford should have taken this advice seriously, as soon enough, she would be stabbed in the back by not Literally. but a stranger but her own classmate. The only difference is that this stabbing is quite literal and real, and there is no going back from it. Also, again, this attack was random and happened for apparently no reason. Growing up in Chicago is like, my, my innate, my, my, the nature of me is if somebody is too nice to me, you are trying to set me up. <laughs> it's a setup, I don't believe it. I know that's a messed up way to think, but it's like, that's how Chicago people think. Like, why is you, nah, it's set up. Everything is a setup to a Chicago person. I, I promise you. I promise you. What you mean? I just met you. You want to go out for a coffee? Like a date? Nah, that's a setup. I ain't going. <laughs> you get me? I'm not having it. That's just, that's just like the nature of a Chicago person. I don't know why we like that. Yes, I do, but it is what it is. Clifford went to freshen up in the Collingwood College bathroom. This is when Sharon approached Clifford, raised her right arm, and suddenly jabbed her four-inch pen knife into her back. The knife punctured Clifford's lung, and she fell to the floor. Sharon fled from the scene, leaving her classmate bleeding on the filthy floor. Fortunately for Clifford, the toilets are a public space, and five other students also decided to freshen up when they got caught in this scenario. After the girls called for help, Anne Marie was taken urgently to Frimley Park Hospital. It seems that Clifford had some real friends after all. If the girls had been even a few minutes late, Clifford would have been another tick on Sharon's murder list. Punctured her lungs, she would have drowned in her own blood, right? The students who disturbed the attack recalled that Carr had actually lured Clifford to the bathroom, saying that she needed help to look for a one pound coin that had been dropped. See what I'm talking about? Like that, that to me personally, I don't care, friend or not, I'm what you need my help for. You want me to come to the bathroom with you and look for a coin, a one, a one pound coin, that's a setup. A setup, and then you want, you want me to walk first? That's all set up to me. In another account of the incident, this time given by Clifford, she reported that when they entered the bathroom, the 14-year-old immediately knocked her classmate over. Anne-Marie somehow managed to defend herself and get up from the floor. That is when Sharon slid her knife into Clifford's back. She just stood over her body, full of glee, and had a smile on her face while she just tossed the pen knife from one hand to another. Anne-Marie screamed, and luckily some students heard it and intervened in the situation. I don't know if I believe the first one is more believe. Arrest. Finally. Sharon was immediately cuffed and arrested for causing serious physical harm. Sharon was then taken to an assessment center for psychological evaluation, where she was quick to show that she was, in fact, out of control and unstable. 
She started to attack witnesses and tried to strangle two staff members in the room. Due to this erratic behavior, Sharon's charges were increased, adding two counts of bodily harm in addition to the charges for attacking Clifford. So in December 1994, she was convicted and given a sentence of two years of arbitrary detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. However, Yo, what about that? W kick. Don't forget to follow me on kick. We're on kick right now. Don't forget, man, what the plan is with kick, right? All the shows that y'all ask me to watch on YouTube that I can't watch on YouTube because they get blocked and copyright issues and things of that nature. And we don't watch them on Patreon because we, we got a certain level of, of, you know what I'm saying, hierarchy to, to keep. We watch them on Kick. Kick is free. Slide. The days that I don't have my daughter, I'm on here five to seven, six hours. Four, no, I'm, I'm tweaking. Four to six hours I'm on here. Come on now. Even if y'all here or not, I'm still here four to six hours. Simple. Hold on, chill, chill, chill. Come on. Now y'all can literally come in the chat, say what shows y'all want to watch, and boom, we just get to it. We just get to it for six hours. You get me. You're right. For Terry detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. However, that's that will be after we do the videos for YouTube. Though. So we come on, do the videos for YouTube, then then we good. The young murderer warned that she should not be underestimated. She was first housed in a number of psychiatric hospitals. Still, because she kept gravely assaulting other females on a regular basis, she was sent to an all boys section at Eyecliff Secure Center. The efforts of the prison service to fend She was so bad she had to go to an all boys area. And off Sharon were obviously unsuccessful. In September 1995, when Sharon was 15 years old, she was sent to Bullwood Hall Young Offenders Institution because it was believed that this facility would be better able to handle her violent and sexualized behavior. Is this a gray hair? Wanting to understand the situation, the yeah, police interviewed down. Sharon, asking her to demonstrate the attack. The police reported that she sat in the back of the police car and demonstrated the stabbing. She laughed mercilessly. The police and staff witnessed Sharon's violent and disruptive nature firsthand. Concerned, they would try to monitor her actions. Have the, like she's been to several psychiatric wards, like no, what, what was her diagnosis? Is she just like insane? Or like, like what's, what, what's the diagnosis? Because we already know like since birth she was dealt a bogus hand. And her conversations with friends and family. They would attempt to overhear the discussion whenever she had visitors in order to keep an eye on the combative girl. In further attempts to get into the mind of the young killer, the staff had a prison guard named Annette to get close to Sharon. The guards started being around her making Sharon feel comfortable in hopes that she would open up. Eventually, the teenager felt at ease with the guard and even developed a little crush on him. Little did he realize that he was going to encounter a grave truth. Sharon started behaving nicely because, well, there was incentive to it. She was soon to be released from prison. She could soon meet her group of troublemakers and boast that she had gone to prison and yet not been caught for the actual murder that she committed. Unfortunately for Sharon, her tendency to show off is what brought her down. When her stay was coming to an end, her loud mouth betrayed her. Sharon let it slip to Annette that Anne Marie was not the only girl that she had slipped. In a lewd attempt to sway the guard, she mentioned that she was only 12 when she killed a girl. She kept dropping hints about another murder that she had committed making no direct claims. However, her specifics about the murder caught the staff's interest. Thankfully, the prison did not dismiss her comments and quickly notified the police and detectives. With no, because in the UK, some of them prisons would be like, eh, 
Anyway. Enough hints dropped, investigators followed the breadcrumbs and quickly made the connection between her illusions and the unsolved murder of Katie Ratcliffe. Sharon did not live far off from where Katie was murdered, but the police officers also knew that it was common for inmates to make false confessions. And seeing as it was a small town and Katie's case had attracted public interest, it would not be off the mark to assume that she had just heard about the murder and was attempting to impress her crush. I mean, she was just 12 years old when the killing happened. But it turns out that Sharon was aware of some very important details of Katie's case that had not been made public. Facts that only the killers themselves would know. You know and they're talking too much, got jammed up, stupid. Well, I mean, good, but... The horn effect. The detectives had Sharon in handcuffs again and took her in for questioning. It must have been a lucky day for the detectives because Sharon was not shy and quickly started singing. The thing with killers is that they are really proud of their killings and especially proud of not being caught. Everybody wants to prove themselves. And serial killers definitely cannot stand giving credit for their clever murders to someone else. She told them the graphic details of the injuries that Katie endured. She even mentioned that at the time of the murder, there had been a dog barking nearby. Along with that, she admitted that she had stolen Katie's bracelet before leaving the dead body. Though she was unable to provide proof of possession, the police knew from the reports that the bracelet had gone missing, and the media, or anyone that mattered, wasn't informed of this. So, whatever she was confessing to... Did you know that in Texas, rifles can be carried in public? She gave it right up. Right up. I want to hear nothing about Florida. <laughs> Honestly. Informed of this. So, whatever she was confessing to, it must be the truth. The officers who arrested Sharon reported that she mentioned that not just humans fell prey to her vile acts. She told them that she enjoyed torturing animals. This was around the time that she took an interest in voodoo. Pets around the block were often nowhere to be found. Sharon got her kick stabbing cats and dogs. She also admitted to having decapitated some of them. The police recalled earlier that when they patrolled the town, they did, in fact, find dozens of animal corpses around the area where Sharon lived. Maybe she was practicing to do the same on humans? Even though Sharon revealed one too many grim details of the attack, there was no way to know what had exactly transpired in the early morning of June 7th when Katie's life she was tell us, taken away. Sharon was a little too generous with her confession and gave two different versions of the event. Okay, here we go. In her first confession, Sharon said that she was in a car, riding along with two male friends of hers who were not teenagers, but rather full-grown adults. Around 4 a.m. in the morning, when the city streets are mostly home to drunk people or the homeless, they were cruising around when they came across Katie, who was walking alone. They offered Katie a ride, and not wanting to walk home alone and drunk, she took them up on it. They went for a while, but... We learn at a young age, don't talk to strangers, don't get in strangers' cars, no matter how enticing it may be. All right. Eventually pulled over in an especially... Took them up on it. They went for a while, but eventually pulled over in an especially isolated and dim area at the edge of some parkland. Katie suspected that something was not quite right, and giving in to her instincts, she made a run for it. Sharon picked up her six-inch knife from the car, got off, and ran after her into the park. Eventually, she caught up with Katie and plunged the knife into her. She started mercilessly stabbing her 32 times, mutilating the body. She realized that she had to move the body, so she returned to the vehicle, only to find that the men she was with had taken off. So, she oh, returned so the to dude, the The dude she was with ain't even want no parts of this. ...crime and dragged the body herself, leaving it in the yard. On her second account, Sharon claimed that one of her accomplices had talked to Katie and taken her with him down the road. She saw them arguing about something, so she went over and stabbed Katie, killing her. However, the central... Katie and Tate dragged the body herself, 
leaving it in the yard. On her second account, okay. Sharon claimed that one of her accomplices had talked to Katie and taken her with him down the road. She saw them arguing about something, so she went over and stabbed Katie, killing her. However, the central theme of the accounts was that she had repeatedly stabbed Katie. Carr said that she was in a car with two boys during the attack and that they had had sex with Katie before disposing of the body. She identified the two lads, but they gave one another alibis and were disregarded from the investigation. Whatsoever transpired on the morning of the 7th, we are sure of one thing. Even though it was just Sharon that was charged with murder, she definitely had accomplices. Given her age, she couldn't have been driving. So some of what she was saying had to be true. One thing that the prosecution couldn't figure out was how a 12-year-old girl dragged Katie, who weighed eight stone and eight pounds, over a sidewalk and around a corner. Gordon Tressler, a criminal psychologist, commented on the case. This is a difficult case to understand. One can find precedence of young children killing other young children. But in this case, it was a child killing someone who is almost an adult. Shady is a child. Here's diary. With this confession, the police got a warrant to search the killer's house. While looking around, the police found Sharon's diaries. It was interesting, to say the least. Apparently, Sharon had started writing in the diaries after Katie's murder, as she became more certain that she wouldn't be caught. The diary was full of disgusting and eerie images and writing, exactly like one would expect from a serial killer. Many of the texts contained overtly sexual and highly violent content that many people would find shocking to hear from an adult, much less a young child. Scrawled carelessly across the diary were some slants on Katie's murder. Sharon had also penned down some of her future ambitions, murder-wise. The detectives took all of Sharon's drawings and writings and took her in for questioning for 27. This reminds me of Death Note. You know, the, the comic, everybody knows the anime Death Note, I mean. Seven hours. She was even seen boasting about killing Katie over the phone to family members and in her jail diaries, which indicated that her murder gave her erotic gratification. Killing for me is a mass turn on, and it just makes me Do not go to fa Keep in mind, she is like 15. Where did she even get this? forgot her parents is where she got her from. I, I never want to come. The mass turn on. And it just makes me so high, I never want to come down. On November of 1995, Carr had written, Last night it occurred to me that killing her did me good. I know what I am capable of and will do it again. She seems to be... See, this is why, this, to me personally, this is why as parents, you got to be in your... Your kids don't have no personal business. No, I'm in your business until you're 18, 19, 20 almost. I'm in your business. You don't have no free time. You don't have no you time. You don't have your business. It's my business. <laughs> it get me, especially like daughters and stuff like that. Like, nah. I need to know what's going on. I'm going to secretly find your diary and read it. Make sure it's, you know what I'm saying? Make sure it's very childlike. She be weirdly proud of herself. But what else can we expect from a girl known as the devil's daughter? She had made numerous sketches of weapons in her diary, especially knives. Under one image of a knife, Sharon said, Oh damn, I've got a taste for red rum. And God... I want to get drunk. What? Oh damn, I got a taste for red rum. Wait, wait. This was in what year? I've got a taste for red rum. And God, I want to get drunk. Yo, no, that's moving wild. That's music. That's moving real wild. Oh damn, I got a taste for red rum. Oh God, I want to get drunk. 
that honestly sounds like a music lyric. In the mid nineties, she was saying this type of stuff. Red rum backwards is murder. I got a taste for murder. And I wanna get drunk, it's crazy. It was clear that killing made her feel in control, like she had power over other people. In another one of her slants about murder, she wrote, I enjoyed putting the blade up her. It made me feel powerful. I had to overcome her serenity, her security. On the third anniversary of Katie's death, Sharon entered in the diary. Killed K.R. Death by knife wounds and sex go together. Sharon was repeatedly under the study of psychologists. They concluded that this journaling was to keep the incident close to her. Most serial killers keep trophies of their crimes, certain personal mementos from their victims. Jeffrey Dahmer kept male genitalia, skulls and hair. Ted Bundy would keep the heads of his victims on display in his apartment. Sharon kept her crime alive in her diary. It was her way of holding on to the thrill that she felt while committing the crime. Another entry in the diary read, I bring the knife into her chest. Her eyes are closing. She is pleading with me, so I bring the knife to her again and again. I don't want to hurt her, but I need to do violence to her. I need to overcome her beauty, her serenity, her security. There, I... Hey, this shit is overly poetic, too. It's like she paid attention in one class, <laughs> poetry or, or something. I see her face when she... This is wild. Like, just the... I died. don't know. I know she feels her life being slowly drawn from her, and I hear her gasp. Y'all weird. <laughs> it is weirdo. Certified. Where do y'all even come from? Ban. What the hell? Delete. Get, get that out of here. Trying to get that off the screen. This is weirdo. Yeah. I guess she, her security. There, I see her face when she died. I know she feels her life being slowly drawn from her, and I hear her gasp. I guess she was trying to breathe. The air stops in the back of her throat. I know all her life her breathing has worked, but it does not now, and I am joyful. A week before she backstabbed Anne Marie. Psychopaths are often very expressive writers. Yeah, I didn't know that. Marie, Sharon had penned down her intentions, and they were not angelic. In her diary, Sharon mentioned that this time the attack would not be short and sweet. She had every intention of stretching the attack and prolonging the murder because Katie's screams had really excited her. I was born to be a murderer. Sharon also mentioned connections with the devil often seeing him in her dreams and even in her mirror reflections. Every night I see the devil in my dreams, sometimes even in my mirror, but I realize it was just me. This is where her well-known nickname came from. The press named her the devil's daughter. Not to provide any excuse for her behavior in any way, but Sharon also expressed a hint of remorse and a feeling of worthlessness and shame in her diary. Look at me, I'm nothing but a disgrace. To my family, I shall no longer show my face. I am a sad specimen of human life. Oh, why did I use that knife? Many health professionals studied Sharon, her thoughts and her behaviors. They were not able to come to a conclusion regarding her condition. They eventually determined that the murderer had schizoaffective disorder, Schizo a mix of schizophrenia and mood disorder. Okay. This condition is characterized by extreme highs and lows, hallucinations, paranoia, and disorderly thinking and behavior. Basically, just madness and depression with shaking hands. All of the symptoms that Sharon had. I bring the knife into her chest. Her eyes are closing. 
She is pleading with me. So I bring the knife to her again and again. Even when she was being held for questioning, Sharon did not stop jotting down her thoughts in her diary, even though she very much knew that it was going to be read. I am not like one of those pretty girls who breaks down from a guilty conscience. Through six and a half years of causing grief, I still have not found one. Sharon did not necessarily provide any physical evidence that would prove her connection with Kate. I did that one already. He's murder. And apparently, she did not need to. Jury members had heard her confession, observed her behavior, and seen her diary. This was enough to prosecute Sharon for the murder of Katie Ratcliffe. Yeah, no doubt, for sure. Trial. In March 1997, a four-week trial started in which the jury heard her admissions. After several hours of discussion, the jury finally decided Sharon Carr was guilty of murder on March 25, 1997. What, what was the sentence? Two weeks prior to the <clears throat> trial, Sharon took back everything she said. She must have had talker's remorse because she just retracted all of her statements. It was too late to realize that actions had consequences. She put the weight on the police. It's a fact. The new economy creates 1,700... ...that the officers had coerced her confessions out of her. No, they didn't. And that she had only said things because she was not right in the head. She was all... That's what I'm saying. This, this gotta be full life sentence. But she is crazy, so they, they could have put her in like a, a psych ward and, you know what I'm saying? What's good with you, man? Already given the greatest excuse, her diagnosed disorder. In the trial that occurred in 1997, Sharon entered a not guilty plea on the grounds of insanity. She was ultimately convicted of the lesser crime of manslaughter nonetheless. The judge sentenced her to an unlimited term with a mandatory minimum of 14 years. But we knew that was coming. We knew that was coming for six reasons. This the UK, first of all, very lenient on sentencing. And she was crazy. She had all that was already established from from earlier that she was like. Something was up with her brain. An unlimited term with mandatory minimum 14 years. So that means she going to a, a psychiatric ward because they can keep you, they can keep you as long as they want to in there until they see you change. But you've got to serve a minimum of 14 years. And if after that 14 years we still don't see no change, I'm just we just gonna keep you. Years. I learned that from watching. Documentaries, that's crazy. In the UK, an indeterminate sentence is one that doesn't have a set length. Instead, those who get this kind of sentence must serve a minimum amount of time behind bars before a parole board may rule that they no longer pose a threat to the public and release them. The judge overturned a prior injunction prohibiting mention of Carr in the media. With that verdict, England gained its youngest female killer. While sentencing, the judge, Mr. Justice Baker Scott, referred to Sharon and said, the evidence suggests that you were not alone when you stabbed Katie Ratcliffe to death. Who the others were and any part they played remains unclear. What is clear is that you had a sexual motive for this killing, and it is apparent both from the brutal manner in which you mutilated her body and chilling entries in your diary recording what you had done that killing, as you put it, turns you on. You are, in my view, an extremely dangerous young woman. Woman. Prison life, okay. This is 97, she was convicted. So how old is she now? 17, 8, 16? Although she was in confinement and not strolling freely in the streets, the public was... Oh, so she was in an actual jail. She wasn't in a um, psychiatric ward or anything. 
Well, back then they were combined though, right? Not happy with the judge's verdict. Strolling freely in the streets. The public was not happy with the judge's verdict. Joseph Ratcliffe, Katie Ratcliffe's father, later spoke to the media about the decision. She should have been hanged. We'll be grieving for the rest of our lives. Even a month after she had been detained for her murder, Carr commemorated the anniversary of the death of her victim by adding the following comments to her diary. Four years today, Sharon was taken to HMP Holloway. Holloway. That is a psychiatric award, isn't it? Psychiatric? A prison for adult women and young offenders in England. The young killer was, however, set to make life difficult for anyone around her. She spent a considerable amount of time in solitary confinement and continued her aggressive and violent behavior toward the staff and patients. This occurred to such a degree Yeah, with that, she probably still in there then. that she had to be transferred from one facility to another. Apparently, no one seemed to be able to contain this now 16-year-old girl. 16. Okay. Ultimately, the hostile teen landed in Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric, Psychiatric Hospital. Hospital. Knew it. Knew it was coming. Sharon often experienced schizophrenic episodes and psychotic episodes. She had started to harm herself as well and would occasionally object to taking her antipsychotic medicine. It also came to report that oftentimes Sharon thought that she was a lizard and in attempts of finding out if she still is in fact a human, she cut her own body. While she was at the facility, she met another patient. This is where Robbie Lizards bleed too. Lynn came into her life. This detainee, described by the police as a walking crime wave, has his own gruesome and horrifying history. This lovely gentleman had been arrested for murdering his own mother. Yes, you heard that right. He battered his own mother to death, stabbing and beating her. If that wasn't enough, Robbie also gouged out her eyes with a Dang, broom. Hey, Robbie! that wasn't enough, Robbie also gouged out her eyes with a broom handle. Sharon and Robbie came across each other at one of the social events organized by the hospital. Love at first sight. After meeting, they totally fell for each other. The hospital allowed them to visit each other's rooms and have recreation periods together. So the psychiatric ward let them, <laughs> let, 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 let Robbie clap cheeks. That's, that's... These visits were limited to once a month and would be completely under supervision, allowing no sexual relations. You're right. I am sure neither of the two was the hospital's star patient. This was no casual thing, as it turned out. Lynn proposed a car, and she said yes. They both looked through the Argos catalog, and Lynn showed a liking for the Elizabeth Duke collection. The rings were chosen and they placed an order for them. Both were given life sentences, so arrangements were made for the Broadmoor chaplain to marry them in the chapel. Now, two detainees falling in love and getting married isn't a very common sight. Unsurprisingly, the incident sparked a little media attention and a newspaper did a piece on the soon to be newlyweds. The week before the wedding arrived, thousands Thousand subs on. T what is this? Oh, this is. Uh, kick on their heels. They can tell I be some, I'm on kick or something. Like, why is so many kick commercials? The couple heard about the story. The couple was interested and wanted to read the piece. Well, as it turns out, the couple had kept big secrets from one another. Love and connection go a long Duh. way, but communication keeps your relationship stronger. The two of them had apparently been unaware of this relationship advice and had been rather economical with the truth regarding why they were patients in that facility. Oh, nobody, the newspaper narrative know. detailed all of their transgressions, leaving no stone unturned. This story took both of them by storm, uncovering the true history of their fiancés. Both of them were left utterly shocked and repulsed beyond belief. How ironic is that? This goes to show how scary <laughs> what? marriage is. Though, 
Not in this scenario, since both of them pretty much deserved each other. Je yeah, yeah, both killers. How y'all gonna be disgusted at each other's killings? Generally speaking, you can never know who someone really is or what they have done in their life. You could marry a serial killer and not know it until you become their next victim. But by then, it's already too late. A male- Thanks buddy, new fear unlocked. A nurse that was present at the scene reported, they both stormed out of a room after seeing the article, apparently disgusted by the ferocity of each other's murder. The new revelation caused both parties to storm out of the room, in separate directions of course, and immediately split up. The wedding was called off despite their having purchased gold rings. They won't even talk to each other now. It is quite amazing that two convicted murderers who fell in love behind bars could be revolted by one another. Broadmoor Hospital. I ain't gonna lie, Robbie, Robbie, you wild. You a wild boy. You a wild boy. I, I can kind of understand where she coming from. Because that's, that's too much. The hospital underwent some constructional changes and was converted into a facility for all boys. So Sharon, along with all the other female inmates, had to be transferred anyway. The wedding plans were thrown in the bin after Sharon read that Lane had gouged his mother's eyes out. And it seems Lane was pretty disgusted by the sadistic murder carried out by his bride-to-be. There was some speculation regarding Sharon being released in 2009. The general public, however, is very much against it, saying that she should never, ever be released. She has continued to be a threat to everyone around her, even when imprisoned. In one incident, Carr threatened to kill another jailmate by splitting her head open with a flask and throwing her down the stairs to snap her neck. Sharon requests vivid. a sentence reduction. In June 2019, after learning that she had fantasized about killing another inmate, Mr. Justice Knowles refused her request for judicial review, and a decision was made not to lower her restricted status. Obviously. And in August 2019, Sharon was transferred to yet another facility, HMP Bronzefield, as a result of an aggressive encounter with another prisoner. Her sentence was reviewed due to assault. This don't even look like a jail, this look like an old folks home or something. Of an aggressive encounter with another prisoner. Her sentence was reviewed due to some submissions and gave the decision to reduce her sentence to 12 years. This news brought shock and sadness to the Ratcliffe family. Katie's mother expressed her thoughts in an exclusive Bro, how? interview. We were horrified when her sentence was reduced. The fact she is now eligible for parole brings it all back up to the surface and forces us to think about it again. I don't feel she should ever be let out because she's a psychopath. She's far too dangerous. She didn't show any remorse at the trial. Experts claim that any mental health expert should know that Sharon would never be fit for release. Professor David Wilson, a TV criminologist, any regular person watching this knows that, commented on the case. I see nothing in terms of Carr's institutional behavior which would warrant parole. Although she has served the minimum mandatory term of 14 years, her sentence has been extended because the authorities continue to view her as a risk to the public. True. As of this moment, Carr is requesting a full release or a transfer to an open prison. If she began using drugs and alcohol at the age of 11, her growing brain would have undoubtedly been impacted. Along with that, growing up in an atrociously abusive household would have also played a huge role in her future. This is not to justify her behavior, rather, to understand how she came to act the way she did. It was also reported that Sharon had intense relationships with females that turned into violent fantasies when thwarted. Many people believed that her attacks had sexual intent, but that is hard to believe due to the fact that Katie and Sharon were complete strangers and there were no signs of sexual abuse. There she stabbed her in the, in the, the anus. And in the front part, that's abuse. Maybe more to the attack than we know. It is possible that, ain't random. that the incident was a result of jealousy. Nasty thoughts through the night. Pure jealousy makes me want to fight. Whatever the reason was, whether she just wanted to exert power, show herself tough in front of her older friends, or just did it because it turned her on, it cost a life, the life of a precious, lovely teenager from a nice family with big dreams 
and an enchanting smile. The detective who spent the most time interviewing Sharon said that she was very different from the people in this world. It was almost as if she had no emotions and was completely disconnected from the rest of the world. Was she a Gemini? She had an eerie coldness about her and an absence of reason in her thoughts. I wish I could kill you again. I promise I'd make you suffer more. Your terrified screams turn me on. The killer just turned 41 in 2022. Thankfully so, is Sharon 42? is still in the hospital and getting her due treatment and medication. Oh, it has oh, come to be noticed that she oh, is getting 43. a little bit more controlled and there is hope for her betterment if she keeps up her psychotherapy and takes her pills. That is why it is uncertain. She's still too young. 43, you can still get out and do some damage. And then you in prison. So I know you, I know you like working out and you physically fit in there. Ugh. If Sharon should be released or not, there is a very high possibility that she will not take her medicine and her aggressive demeanor is going to bring more death. Thanks for tuning in to- Nah, she gotta stay up in there. You can go ahead and stay in there. Uh, uh, crazy Killers is different. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on the post notification bells, follow me on KICK. I'm gone.